And now in this video we will present the method of moments which is, as it says here in the slide, the most commonly used method to discretize electromagnetic integral equations. There are many, there are other methods. L later, after method of moments, we will also see Nystrom method that is very good but much less popular. But the method that almost everybody uses, the most widely used, is method of moments. Method of moments can discretize any linear equation. It must be linear, okay? But if it is linear, it can be discretized by method of moments. It can be also a differential equation, like for example the wave equation. And if you discretize the wave equation with method of moments, you may obtain a, method of, a finite element method formulation. But we will uh, talk about this, uh, discuss about this later. And now we will concentrate in integral equations and discretize by method of moments. So we have a linear operator, L. The linear operator operates uh, on an unknown function x. x is the unknown. And it, the operator uh, applied to the unknown function is equal to some known function y, which is the independent term or uh, excitation term. In the case of the electric field integral equation here, clearly we identify n cross the convolution with the Green's function as the operator L. The equivalent current is the unknown x. And the left, sorry, the right hand side minus n cross incident field is the independent term y, okay? And this will be discretized. The aim is to discretize this integral equation into a linear system where a will be some coefficients that represent the unknown function x. b is the discretization of the independent term independent, independent term y. And set matrix that for historical reasons in the antenna community is called the impedance matrix and it is and set letter is used because it's called the impedance matrix set matrix or impedance matrix is the matrix that discretizes the operator l okay so we have that the unknown that the that a matrix that discretized operator L times the unknown is equal to the independent term and we solve the linear system to obtain X or sorry A to obtain A that are the samples or coefficients that represent the unknown. Well how can we make this discretization? Well the first thing that we have to do is to discretize the unknown X must be discretized as a linear combination of some basis functions. These basis functions, let's change the color, these basis functions in blue color are x. x depend on, on r and r n basis functions, so the subindex n uh, ranges from 1 to uppercase n, which is the number of uh, basis functions, okay? And uppercase n is the number of basis functions and after the discretization we have n coefficients a n that are the coefficients of the linear combination of basis functions that represents the unknown x. I repeat, the unknown is expanded in a linear combination of basis functions. Of course, at the end, this will be just an approximation, but this will be an approximation that can be very good if n, the number of basis function, is very large. So the unknowns become these a n coefficients. And since we have n coefficients like this, uppercase n, which is the number of basis functions, and the n, n is equal, is equal to the number of unknowns. So within the whole uh, 
uh, chapter about numerical methods, uppercase N will be the number of unknowns. And always, for all the methods, for us, N will represent the number of unknowns. So, we replace, in our original integral equation, we replace X, which is the unknown, by the approximation to the unknown as a linear combination of basis functions. So we have operator L and the that applied to the to x n, which is the approximation to the unknown. So this operator L apply, applied to x n enters inside the linear combination summation because L is linear. And this is the reason why L must be a linear operator, because it enters within the summation and also we get the multiplication by coefficients a n, we get this out of operator L. So at the end, what remains, very important, what remains is operator L applied to the basis functions, which are an, another set of functions. So at the end, what we have, observe, that what we have is a linear combination, a linear combination with the same coefficients a n, but now it's a linear combination of the operator L applied to the set of basis functions, okay? Now the unknowns in our equation, the unknowns are a n. The unknown is no longer a function x, but now it is a set of n coefficients a sub n. Okay, very important. The unknowns are the coefficients. But still we cannot we cannot solve this with, with a computer yet because it is still a functional equation. Although the unknowns are now coefficients is instead of a function, we still have a function here. It's a function of R. So we have to convert this function into a set of numbers that can be programmed in a computer. So how we do that? Well, we recognize that the aim is to have a very good approximation here because remember that we have substituted the exact unknown x with, with an approximate unknown xn, which is a linear combination of the basis functions. So we want to be this approximation as good as possible. So this approximation sign here must have the minimum error. So we write the error in this approximation sign. So the error is the right hand side member minus the left hand side member. So the error is the independent term minus the linear combination of the linear operator L applied to the basis function. And we want this to be approximately equal to zero. We want the, we, this error that is called the residual. This is the residual error. We want to be this residual error be as close as possible to zero. So we want this to be the residual error approximately equal to zero. What we do is to weight this error with some weighting functions and make the weighted error equal to zero. So we weight with the inner product, the scalar product, with some weighting functions here. This W stands for weight from, this W here means weighting function and M means that we have M, uppercase M, uh, weighting functions. Then M, uppercase M, is the number of weighting functions, okay? Uh, uppercase M is the number of weighting functions. So, uh, we work with the inner product, with the scalar product, and the inner product for um, for functions, you know that the inner product or scalar product for vectors is multiplying um, component by component, then sum or multiply all, all products together. 
and for functions we multiply the first function times the conjugate of the second and integrate in the domain where we have the functions defined okay and this is the inner product so now observe that when we set this equal to zero i will remove all the marks when we set this inner product equal to zero now we have numbers because the, this weighting is a number okay and we have one number per each weighting function so this in fact this is a, we can observe this in fact this is a linear system this is a linear system where the unknowns are the n a n the independent term is this sorry the independent term is this and this is what we call b here the known is a here and what is what is the linear system matrix well we can observe that here the the unknowns n are multiplied by some coefficients this is a number this, this is a scalar product or inner product so it is a number and this number depends on the row index m and on the column index n so this is the element of the impedance matrix so it's this the element of the impedance matrix so this is the linear system matrix also called impedance matrix sorry no so this is the impedance matrix now we have everything we have the elements of the linear system matrix the matrix that is called the impedance matrix and we also have the equations for the uh, independent term here in blue color the independent term here in blue color for the independent term okay this is the independent term okay so we have everything and the nodes are a n so in practice we have to to solve this in practice we have to determine which weighting functions we have to use so it is important the, the selection of the weighting functions is important well it is very common to use weighting functions that are deltas if weighting functions are deltas when we weight the residual with a delta remember that this uh, inner product this inner product is in fact the multiplication of the of the delta the weighting function times the residual which is the other function and we have to we have to conjugate one of them remember here that we have a conjugate so we have to conjugate one of them we will conjugate the delta which is real okay so if it is real there is no need if it is real there is no need to conjugate it okay and then observe that this is the integral of a function with a delta center at rm so the result is the function the residual we, uh, sampled RRN. So what we are doing with this point matching or collocation method that consists on setting weighting functions that are equal to del delta functions, what we are doing is to sample the residual. Sampling the residual, in fact, 
is uh, the obvious thing that we that everybody would uh, do. So if, if we have a residual, it is obvious that the simplest idea, the simplest idea is to sample the residual at sorry R M we sample the residual at R M okay then we just have this we want this equal to zero so what we do is to set this to equal and we get this okay so just this collocation method or using or using delta weighting functions is as simple as sampling the residual so sorry this is m sorry sorry this is uh, m sub index here because we are sampling at rm of course we can set m equal to n in order to have a uh, number of equations equal to a number of unknowns we have uh, one equation for each uh, weighting function okay in this case we have one equation for each uh, rm for each sampling point in the case that in the case that m again in the case that we are using sampling we have one equation for for each sampling point okay so it's very simple you will uh, see this very clearly when you do the assignment but you will have to write this matrix in the assignment you will use this collocation method or point matching uh, which is a sampling and we will you will get in fact this 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 linear system from the sampling okay so this is the simplest the simplest idea and what we get is is just we just set the number of sampling point equal to the number of unknowns so that the linear system matrix is a square and since the matrix is a square we can we can solve easily the linear system otherwise the if the matrix if m is different than n if the number of rows equal to weighting functions is different than the number of columns equal to the number of basis functions then the system is overdetermined or underdetermined and there is no easy solution. Of course, we use a square linear system when possible. Number of weighting functions equal to number of basis functions. So m equal n and the linear system is a square and everything is easy to solve the to solve uh, this. Okay. So this is not the only solution. We can also set uh, weighting functions equal to the basis function. This is very often used also. This is very common also. And it is called Galerkin method. So it's important you must know the name Galerkin method. You must know that it, Galerkin method consists on setting the testing functions or basis functions sorry, testing functions or weighting functions, testing is equal to weighting. So I will some, sometimes say testing, other times I will say weighting, and these are the functions that allow us to convert the, the, the functional equation into a linear system of equations, okay? Different thing are the basis functions to discretize the unknown. Okay, so in, in, in Galerkin method, the testing or weighting functions are equal to the basis function. So automatically, we have m equal to n because m is the number of weighting functions, n the number of testing functions, and since, since we said, sorry, m is the number of weighting functions and n is the number of basis functions. So if we set the weighting functions equal to the basis functions, automatically we have m equal to n and we have a square linear system. Okay? And this is also very, very common. So in this case, 
we have to compute the integrals because remember that this that this uh, inner products with the weighting functions that in this case are equal to the basis functions these inner products are integrals so we have to compute the integrals very often when the when the integration domain is very when the integration domain is very uh, small if we have to integrate the product we have to we have to integrate the product of this function times this other function and the integration domain is very uh, small here for example if the integration domain is very uh, small then these two functions are almost constant so the product is almost constant and we can compute the integral as the area of the product just multiplying multiplying a sample at the center which is the height times the the launch the length of the interval which is the basis of the rectangle okay so often this integral of the inner product can be made with just one integration one sample of the function of the product of the two functions multiplied by the length of the interval of the integration very often and we often come to this because the the basis functions are defined in a in a small interval The basis functions are often defined in a small interval, so we set the weighting functions equal to the basis function, so both of them are defined in a small interval, so the interval of integration is, that is this here, sorry here, the interval of integration that is this is very small and often the functions are almost constant. In A very simple example of basis function we have the pulse, the rectangular pulse and triangular pulse basis functions. In fact, they are called pulse basis functions, the rectangular one, and often triangular basis functions, the, the triangular one. You can see that they approximate the, the unknown in the following way. We define a set of pulses, for example, in red color, we have the first, the first, um, the first basis function called x1 and is located at r1 and it's a, pool, a rectangular pulse of amplitude equal to 1. In blue color we have the second, next to it, the second basis function also of amplitude 1 and located at point R2. And in green color we have the third pulse or rectangular pulse basis function amplitude 1, it's called X3, X3 and it's located at R3. Now we multiply the we multiply X1 times A1 here so X1 times A1 becomes a rectangular pulse of height equal to A1. Then uh, <coughs> the second basis function X2 is multiplied by A2, so it becomes a rectangular pulse I'm sorry, of height of height A2. And the third Rectangle, the third uh, basis function x3 is multiplied by a3 and becomes a rectangular pulse of height a, a3 and center at r3 while the first was centered at, at r1 and the second basis function was centered at r2. So these three pulses, these three pulses a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus a3 x3 may approximate, can approximate 
the unknown, the unknown is this, this is the unknown, can approximate the unknown if the coefficients a1, a2 and a3 are values of the unknown at the position of the basis function, that is a1 equal to the unknown at position r1 here, okay? a1 equal to the unknown and position r at position r1. Similarly, a2 would be equal to the unknown at position r2 and a3 are equal to the unknown at position r3. So, in case that we know the unknown and want uh, to approximate with rectangular pools, we know the values <coughs> of the unknown x at positions r1, r2 and r3 and make these values equal to the linear combination coefficients a1, a2, a3. But in this case, we don't know the unknown x. This is why it is the unknown. So we solve a linear system and the solution of the linear system are the coefficients a1, a2, a3. So in this case, when we get the coefficients a1, a2, a3, we set the samples of the unknown equal to this coefficient. So we first get these coefficients and make the samples of the unknown equal to these coefficients. Okay? So this creates a staircase approximation of the unknown. This creates, let's just delete this, okay? This, what we have created, is a staircase approximation of the unknown. Just by setting the unknown equal, here you can observe that the unknown is equal to the collection of pulses of height uh, A1 times X1, A2 times X2, etc. Okay? So it's a staircase approximation like this. We can do it better. For example, if we choose triangular, let's delete this, if we choose triangular basis functions, the first basis function will be a triangle of height 1 center at R1, the second basis function would be, would be a triangular of height 1 center at R2, the third basis function would be a triangle of height 1 center at R3 and observe that the triangles overlap so the centers of the triangles at R1, R2, R3 but the, the sides of the triangle end at the, at the center of the neighbor triangle so the triangles overlap in that, in that way they overlap okay so as we did before, we have to multiply the first triangle x1 by coefficient a1, so we get a triangle of height a1. The second triangle x2 is multiplied by coefficient a2, and we get a triangle of height a2. The third, we do the same thing for the third triangle, okay, and we get a triangle of height a3. Now we sum the triangles. We sum the, the triangles of height a1, a2, a3. And since the triangles overlap, what we get, since the triangles overlap, what we get is a line from a1, from the top of triangle a1 to the top of triangle not this, from the top of triangle A1 to the top of triangle, let me, okay. So we get this, okay, oh there is some kind of a snapping, uh, okay, but you see what, what you can see here, you can see what I mean, what I mean is that we get some kind of a uh, linear approximation using a strike line segments that join the samples of the 
of the unknown. So it is much better approximation because in, with rectangular post basis, basis function we have a, a staircase approximation while with triangular basis functions we get a linear approximation of the unknown which is much better. Okay? It, it is uh, the very easy to program the rectangular basis functions because they don't overlap and since they are constant it is also easier to compute the integrals but re because remember we need to compute integrals because remember that the elements of the impedance matrix are given by the linear operator applied to the to the basis function the linear operator remember that the linear operator was the convolution with the Green's function here the linear operator L here was L was the convolution with the Green's function so this involves an integral this involves an integral and it is easier easier to integrate the linear the linear so it is easier to integrate the basis functions in the, if they are constant or uniform pulses rather than if they are triangles. If there are triangles, the integral is a bit more difficult and also the, program, the programming is also less easy because the triangles overlap. But anyway, it's not that difficult and you can do this uh, without any problem. And observe that to, that, that to have a good approximation, to have a good approximation, we have to, to sample, to use the width of the width of the basis functions must must be small enough to have the unknown approximately constant within the the basis function. That is, if we have to approximate a function like this, not better if we have to approximate if we have to approximate a function like this, okay? A, it, w it will not be a good approximation with a pulse like this will not be a good approximation because the pulse is too large but a good approximation would be with a smaller pulses okay so the idea is to use uh, basis functions that are defined in intervals delta that are uh, small enough so delta is small, small enough to have the unknown function approximately constant within this interval. For that reason, in the previous slide, I say I said that when the weighting function is equal to the basis function in Galerkin method, since the basis function is defined in a very small interval where the functions are approximately constant, then the same happens for the uh, testing or weighting function so the product between between them well so not the product between them the product between the the, the weighting function is defined this is defined in a small interval like the basis function so the product of the weighting function times the residual is done in a very small interval the both functions are approximately constant and for that reason very often to compute the, the integral of that function, we just sample, since it, is, since it is approximately constant, we just sample at the center and compute the area of the triangle of basis delta, okay? And this is, in fact, a, what is called a one-point integration. That means just sample the, the, the function and use a rectangular integration rule. Okay. Well, the rectangular pulse basis functions and also the triangular uh, basis functions of the previous slide were defined in one dimension for one dimensional functions. However, we have in real life we have three dimensional problems and the according to equivalence theorem we have uh, surface enclosing a volume etc and we have the equivalent currents that we have to discretize defined on a surface so in practice in a three-dimensional life problem 
what we have to discretize is uh, the known, the current, defined on a surface. So we have to define functions equivalent to these poles or triangular basis functions, but now defined on a surface. It's very easy see, to define two-dimensional pulses. For example, if we have x uh, axis here and y axis here, we can define the same pulse basis functions as before, like this, on x direction, and then they are also pulses in y direction. So at the end, we have a, a, well, a, a prism, a cubic prism like that. And it's very easy to understand that essentially it's the same thing that we have in one dimension, but now in two dimensions. And this could work for a planar surface. Imagine, for example, a perfectly conducting planar plate that is discretized in, in rectangular cells, and we could define one basis function of the one basis function per per cell. Okay, we could define one basis function per cell like this. However, the problem is that the electric field integral equation include the electric field integral equation includes the, the operator the Green's function to, that gives the electric field due to a current. The electric field due to current is essentially the time derivative of the vector potential minus the gradient of the scalar potential. And the scalar potential is the convolution of the scalar Green's function with the charge. And the charge, as you know, according to continuity equation, the charge is the divergence of the current over minus j omega. So, within the Green's function for the electric field due to a current, we have to compute the divergence of the current. And the divergence of the current involves derivative operators. The divergence, in fact, is the for a current that in this case we are in a car, uh, we are we have a current like this. We have a current that uh, consists on two components j x and j y. Okay, for x and y axis, it has two components, j x and j y. So the divergence is the derivative with respect to x of the x component plus the derivative of respect to y of the y component. So this means that we need that the x component is continuous along x in order to compute the derivative without getting singularities. and y and uh, y component of the current continues uh, along y direction this is not the case of this uh, proof of this pulse uh, two dimensional pulse basis functions because they have steps they have these steps in the y direction and here steps in the x direction that produce infinite derivatives so we need to modify the pulse basis function in order to have finite divergence of the current, which is in fact the, the charge times min, minus g omega. So, we modify the basis functions in the following way. The x component and the y component are discretized with using different basis functions each. The basis function that discretizes the x component, the, this is the x axis, is triangular in the x direction so the derivative is, is finite and there are no singularities. However, it is uniform or rectangular in the y direction because we don't have to derivate the x component in the y direction. We only derivate in the x direction and it is already triangular in the x direction to allow the derivative. The same thing for the y component. The y component is discretized in a different basis function. So for that, uh, cell of current, we have two components, one x component discretized with one basis function and the other component, y component discretized with another basis function. So at the end, we have twice the the, the number of, of unknowns, the number of basis functions is twice the number of cells because we need one basis function for the x component and another basis function for the y component. Okay. And then the y component 
is, is discretized in a basis function that is triangular along y because we need to derivate the y component along y with respect to y coordinate and it is uniform along x direction because we do not we do not derivate y component in x direction okay so the basis functions that we will use are like this and these are the are called rooftop because they have the shape of a rooftop they are called the rooftop basis function rooftop here they are called the rooftop basis function so do we have for each cell we have two rooftop basis functions and also they are triang they are triangular in one direction so they overlap in one direction remember that the triangular basis functions overlap in this uh, cell here we have overlapping of the basis function 1 with basis function 2 in this second cell here we have overlapping of basis function 3 with a basis function 2 the same happens in in two dimensions now in two dimensions we have an overlap for example in this cell we have an overlap of the basis function in the in the y direction with a base see a different basis function also in the y direction okay but this is still more overlap because we also have basis functions in the x direction that are triangular so they occupy those two cells observe that the face basis functions occupy two cells in the direction where they are triangular and only one cell in the direction where they are um, uh, uniform okay and then last color yellow color there is in x direction the x component is triangular then the so we still have another overlap here so at the end in the cell represented by the black point here we have four basis functions overlapping two basis functions that are triangular in two basis functions for the x component in fact for each component we only have two basis functions overlapping but overall if we take into account the two components if for the current vector we have four basis functions overlapping in if we take into account only one component there are let's do uh, let's repeat the drawing like this imagine for example I will uh, plot uh, to this is the discretization of the x component and this is the discretization of the y component this is uh, here sorry this is x axis okay and this is y axis so x component is x component is triangular in x direction so it occupies two cells and uniform in y direction it occupies one cell so this overlaps this overlaps with another basis function that is triangular in x direction so you know that triangular basis functions occupy two cells so here uh, the x component has the overlap of two basis functions uh, that are triangular in x direction okay and then in the same cell we have defined sorry this is y in the same cell we have defined for the y component we have defined also uh, rooftop basis functions that are triangular um, sorry let's change the color that are triangular in y direction so they occupy two cells in y direction and they are uniform in x direction so they occupy one cell in x direction and they overlap with the basis functions that in, uh, that in the next cell along y that since they are triangular in y they occupy two cells in y direction so here we also have the overlap 
of two basis functions that are in y direction that because they are triangular in y direction and occupy two cells. So overall, for a given, imagine for example in that cell here, which is the same cell here, cell here, we have the overlap of two basis functions for x component of the current plus two basis functions for the y component of the current. So regarding the current vector consisting on x and y component, we have in total four overlapping uh, basis functions. And what happens, and this is, all this is for planar surfaces. As I said before, I said this, I said this before, this is for planar surfaces. And here I made a drawing of a planar surface. If the surface is not planar, we, the easiest thing is to discretize in triangles like this, in triangular basis functions like this, of triangular cells. They to discretize with triangular cells, and there are uh, lots of there are lots of computer software that are able to build a triangular mesh, a mesh of triangular cells, for any given shape. Okay, for any for any object, there are lots of software that can do that. And then, in the same way as we define the basis function, the rooftop basis function here, they have to be they have to have uh, finite divergence of the current, and finite divergence of the current means that uh, we have to be able to compute the, the derivative along the direction of the current without any discontinuity to have a non-singular derivative. So this, uh, uh, this curve this is defined in this rooftop basis function, this, top, this rooftop basis function discretize they are vector basis functions in which the vector of currents are defined like this and like this. So, in the direction of the current, they are continuous. Observe that in the direction of the current, they are in fact triangular. And in the direction perpendicular to the current flow, that, that's that, they are rectangular because they fall to zero abruptly. Okay? So, they are triangular in the direction of the current, they are rectangular in the direction perpendicular to the current flow, the same as the rooftop uh, functions. In the rooftop functions, the flow of the current in x direction is like this, the flow of the current is like this, so they are triangular in the direction of the flow, current flow, and rectangular in the direction normal to the current flow. Okay? So we have the same thing here for triangular cells. The only thing is that we have collapsed one side of the square cells of the rooftops in one point. Here, imagine that we collapse, imagine that we collapse this uh, side into one point, so we get something like this, okay? This is, in fact, what we have here. We have collapsed one side of the of the square cell defining the rooftop basis functions into a point. So that now our cells supporting the basis functions are triangular. Our basis functions still need to span on two cells, the same as rooftops that span on two cells, one cell here and the other cell here. The triangular, this triangular uh, basis functions span uh, again in two cells, but and they are based on, on triangles, on triangular cells, okay? These are very important. These are called, they have a name, they, they are called Rao, Wilton and, Rao, comma, Wilton and Gleason basis functions, for short, as the acronym is RWUG. So in the literature, in the books, in the papers, journal papers, in the conferences, everywhere you will hear to speak, you will hear about these are WG basis functions. These are these functions that can discretize uh, the current on any surface using a triangular mesh, and they are very similar to the roof to basis functions. The only thing is that now they are defined on triangular cells instead of rectangular cells. You can fool, you can, if you're interested in, you can find the definition and uh, of these basis functions in many papers, but in particular, you know, in Atenea, I have created a folder 
of interesting papers and I have <coughs> put many papers there. One of the papers there is a paper made by Rao, Wilton and Gleason in 1982, so almost 40 years ago, where they defined these basis functions. There are more, many more papers. The last two papers that I added, add, I add there, are papers regarding the multilayer, the Green's function for multilayer structures that was discussed, discussed at the questions and answer session of yesterday. So there are the, uh, these are the two new papers that are there. But anyway, you can find the definition of these basis functions there. So. In principle, this is the minimum knowledge on method of moments that you must have. I think it's just enough for you to have an overall idea, to understand uh, books and papers when you are, if you have to read about them, or to understand uh, the software when, if you use some software and this software uses method of moments to discretize an integral equation, now you can understand what the software is doing to discretize the equations. And you can also do the assignment on method of, of moments. The first assignment, you are now ready to do this. Except a part on Nystrom method, that is the, the next method that I will uh, explain. I will show you now an example of an object in which the surface integral equation, the electric field integral equation, is discretized with a triangle mesh. And after I will show you an alternative way to, dis to discretize a surface for analyzing with integral equations and method of moments. So this is the typical example that I sh always uh, show. The, we have done in our laboratory the software we have written the software, the may, we have done the meshing, we have also done the measurement for comparison, etc. Here we have a triangle mesh consisting on R double UG and triangular, uh, double triangular basis functions, as I explained before. The number of unknowns is almost 70,000, so it's a lot, and <coughs> we have used a fast solver to obtain the solution because otherwise you have a <coughs> you have a linear system of order 70,000 and this is a lot. This would take a lot of memory and many many computation hours using a conventional uh, way to to uh, to solve the linear system and with a fast solver it takes just a few minutes. I don't remember well now but I think it was about 5 minutes with a quite old computer, maybe 10 years ago or something. And this is the induced current, is the, the magnitude of the induced current at every point. So this is a very conventional way of showing the, in the results for the induced current. We can see here, it is electric field integral equation, okay? So remember that with electric field integral equation, we can analyze open surfaces so this is clearly an open surface, okay? Because it is it, it's like this. There are four there are four uh, sides of of the horn, four sides. This is obviously a horn antenna. You know that very well from your antenna theory courses. You have we have here uh, the object consists on four sides and each is an open surface. So only the electric field integral equation can analyze the open surface. And remember that for the electric field integral equation, the unknown is the sum of the current in the inside and the current in the outside. The current, according to the boundary condition, the current is the tangent component of the magnetic field. So we have a strong magnetic field inside the uh, antenna and well, this is not like that, it would be uh, transverse, but anyway, you have a strong magnetic field in the, at, the in, uh, at the inside of the antenna, uh, a small or weak magnetic field outside the surface of the antenna. So we have a strong current inside the surface and very weak current outside the surface. Here, the unknown of the electric field integral equation for open surfaces is the sum. So the colors that we can see here, 
show the sum of the current inside plus the current outside. Since the current inside is much larger than the current outside, this is approximately equal to the current inside. Okay? So, the current inside is the tangent component of the magnetic field. And you can clearly see here the TE10 mode. This is clearly the TE and constant in, in this plane. This is clearly the TE10 mode. That is cosenoidal in H plane and is uh, uniform in E plane. So this is H plane. This is E plane, okay? I have also shown this example in the Antenna Theory course, so those of you who have studied with me the Antenna course in, in, the, tele, in the Telecom School, you will have seen that before. But anyway, this is just to show you the very uh, the most common way to, to show the induced current in, in colors, okay? You can also see how the current attenuates as, it, as the wave travels along the horn, the current attenuates because the, the wave from es expands and you know that when the wave from expands you get a, a power reduction of 1 over r square or field reduction on 1 over r, okay? And this is the radiation pattern. Anyway, it's a, it, it's a nice example. Here we have the, the field at the aperture. This is just for, for uh, pedagogic. It's just uh, to see that the, the field is approximately, approximately, not exactly, approximately a TE10 mode, okay? But now an alternative way to model the, the uh, surface for analysis with electric field integral equation. Remember that we can build a, a, a reflecting surface using, using wires. We can build a grid of wires, and if we have an incident plane wave, incident field, okay, the, the wire grid will reflect the polarization, the electric field polar polar polarization, parallel to the wires. And it will be transparent to the electric field polarization that is perpendicular to the wires, okay? So if we want to build a, a surface that reflects both polarizations, we would build a uh, surface like this. Okay. And of course, as I told you before when we were talking about metamaterials, the uh, distance between wires must, must be much smaller, the distance between wires must be much smaller than the wavelength. Typically less than wavelength over 10 better if it is wavelength over 20. Okay? So, if this uh, setup works for reflecting uh, the electric field in the same way as a solid uh, metallic surface, why not use this for numerical analysis? So, for numerical analysis, the same as this surface reflects the electric field, we can simulate a solid surface and build our, our, our simulation model is just a wire grid. You can see this, for example, here. This is, a, this is some well-known software that is called NIC, NEC, Numerical Electromagnetic uh, Code. And here we can see the surface. The surface of the ship is modeled as uh, the, the solid surface, this is, this is a solid surface, okay? The solid surface of the ship is modeled with a wire grid. And here we set the, the electric field integral equation for wires. And this is easy, and in fact, it is older. This, this um, way to analyze the 
surface in integrals equations is older than the triangle mesh with Rao, Wilton and Gleason triangles because it is not that difficult to model uh, to compute the electric field radiated by a wire uh, you have a, the, some current in a wire to, com to, to compute the field produced by a current in a wire is not so difficult and we can al also set the boundary condition along the wire is not that difficult and the formulation for this is quite old it, it's maybe from the uh, 60s or the 70s the Pocklington integral equation, the Harlan integral equation, they are integral equations that come from analyzing the radiation or in also induced fields that feels due to a current in, in a wire and setting the boundary condition at the wire surface. This is quite old and since we can do that, this for a wire antenna like this, this is a monopole antenna with a, with a ground plane made of, of four wires. Since we can do this uh, easily, we can do the same thing for a grid like this. And this grid will simulate very accurately, or quite not very accurately, but with enough accuracy, we simulate with, with enough accuracy the solid surface of the ship. So with this software, we can analyze wire antennas like this Helix antenna, or the monopole antennas in the previous here we have many antennas that can be analyzed with wire modeling all of them are made of wires and also the reflector planes are, are made of wires but these are reflector planes that are made of wires already in the antenna but here the in the object is a solid the object is a solid plate and we made a model that is a grid of wires okay and this works very well. In fact, it is quite older than the, it's it's older than the most commonly used approach now. That is the triangle mesh. You can get uh, by free the next software. You can get it because it's obsolete. It's so old, and now the modern software is better. So they release the software for free. In fact, it was military, it was not commercial software, software it was military software, but uh, they released, made by the US Army. So, for example, here you have a ship because it was made by the US Army, okay? But now they released the, the software, you can get it on the internet. The original software is very old, so it is uh, based on command line in the command line in the terminal the input parameters and geometry are in input text files the output is not graphical the output is also in text files etc so you can find in the internet new uh, input and output uh, vis um, visualization tools tools that allow you to create the input text files and analyze the output text files and allow you to visualize the results so here you have two examples that you can get in the internet and you can you can play and you can play with them. So my goal was only to show you that the triangle mesh is not the only way to model a, a solid perfectly conducting surface but there you can do other things like for example the second option the the old way but uh, now the second option is just the the wire grid okay now let's move to Nystrom method. Well, now we will see that in fact method of moments is not the only method to discretize integral equations. There are other options, but of course, as I told you before, method of moments is the most commonly used in electromagnetics. But there are other options and I will show you one of them. I showed you Nystrom method because I like it very much. It's very simple and very accurate when it works. But the problem is that it uh, easily works for fa to when you integrate functions that are not singular. When the, uh, you integrate a function, a non-singular function, in fact, the known often is non-singular. So when the 
Green's function or kernel of the integral is non-singular, the Nystrom method works very well. The problem, as we will see later, is that we have a singular base, uh, a singular Green's function in electromagnetics, and this makes very uh, much more difficult to program an accurate uh, implementation of, of Nystrom method. Anyway, I will explain it to you very briefly, because although uh, rarely used in electromagnetics, it's very, very good, and it can be applied in other fields of physics and engineering, where the integral uh, has uh, is in the integral of a non-singular function. So, what we have as as before, we have an integral equation. In this case, I have written a second kind integral equation. It's an integral equation in which the, the in which the unknown x x is of course the unknown. Okay in which the unknown x is both inside the integral, often a convolution integral, and outside the integral. The method would work also with a first kind integral equation that doesn't have the unknown outside the integral. However, as you will see later, the results are particularly accurate when the integral equation is second kind, that is, when you have the unknown also outside the integral. The key of the Nystrom method is to discretize the integral using Gauss quadrature. I just remind you about Gauss quadrature. Probably, probably you have seen them in your mathematics courses, but I will show you the Wikipedia, Wikipedia page about Gauss quadrature. And you will see that it is an, an approximation here. It's an approximation of the definite integral of a function as a weighted sum of function values at a specified points within the domain of integration. For example, here you will see that we have the integral of a function f approximated as, a, as the summation of some samples of f times some weights. For example, if you use the, the very simple rectangular integration rule, the weights would be equal to 1, and in the rectangular integration rule, you just sum x space samples of f. However, in, in Gauss uh, quadrature rule, you can add some weights that gives a much more accurate result using a smaller number of samples. You can read uh, about Wikipedia here and you can find, for example, that for the most commonly for the most commonly used uh, rules, you can see here, for example, given the number of integration points, you can see here the formulas for the uh, points, the sampling points in the integral and the weighting of the samples, okay? In fact, in the assignment you will have to implement Nystrom method and I will give you a MATLAB function that computes the sampling point xi and the weights wi. So, the only thing that you will have to do to solve the assignment is to run given the number of samples that you want, the number of samples uppercase n, you will run my function and my function will give you the sampling points, oh sorry, oh, what happened? The sampling points here and the weights uh, here. Okay? And then you only have to multiply sample, the samples of the function times the weights and sum up all together. Now we go back to the our slides here. So we approximate the integral using Gauss rule and it becomes the summation of the weights times the function, which is this. This is the function sample at some sampling points Tj. Okay, and we have the weights also. Okay, how 
can we choose the sampling points and the weights? Well, the sampling points or abscissas, TJ, TJ and the weights are such that the approximation is exact for some family of functions. We choose a family of functions that uh, such that our uh, in the, our function to integrate the function that we want to integrate is this this is the function that we want to integrate so we choose a family of functions that are similar to the function that we want to integrate for example we can choose polynomials pn polynomials in this case if our function is smooth like a trigonometric function, like a sinus or a cosinus, is smooth and doesn't have discontinuities and doesn't have singularities or discontinuities of the derivative, etc. It is smooth and the derivatives are also smooth. Our function then will, will be, can be approximated with expansion or a linear combination of polynomials. And if our function can be approximated with a linear combination of polynomials, what we can do is choose weights and abscissas such that the approximation of the integral is exact when we integrate that family of functions, in this case, just polynomials, okay? So in this case, we choose polynomials up to, to degree 2n minus 1, okay? And we choose a set of, of and I say 2 n minus 1 because the degrees of freedom is 2 n minus 1. We have, um, we have, if we have n points, n points, then we have n values of the sampling positions and n values of the weights, okay? So we have two n degrees of freedom, but one of them is fixed, so at the end we can integrate polynomials up to degree two n minus one. In fact, we can also integrate polynomials of degree zero. So we integrate two n polynomials up to degree two n minus one. Okay? So this is the so-called Gauss-Legendre quadrature. Very often, the set of weights and abscissas that we choose are this set of abscissas and weights that integrate exactly polynomials. And these are called the Gauss-Legendre um, quadrature abscissas and, and, weighting, and weighting values. My, the function, the MATLAB function that I give you uh, uh, is, gives, just gives you the Gauss quadrature, uh, sorry, the Gauss-Legendre uh, integration abscissas and, and weights, okay? So we'll, you only have to run my function and get them. So, once you approximate the integral with the quadrature rule, you get this. But you still have t. t is the point where you evaluate the convolution and is the point at which you set the equality of the integral equation. In fact, it is the point where you, if the integral equation from, comes from the electric or the magnetic field integral equations, that is, it comes from applying the boundary condition at surface equivalence theorem, then this equality is the boundary condition and T is the, are the points at which we evaluate the boundary condition. So we discretize T just with samples, okay? At some sampling points. And once we have discretized T, what we get is just a replacement of t here by ti everywhere, okay? ti everywhere. Just a sampling at ti. And these are no longer functions, these are numbers. So this is a linear system. The, <coughs> the independent term is, uh, is obviously as the samples uh, independent term are obviously the samples uh, the, the independent function sam samplet sorry uh, what happened 
The independent term are obviously samples of the independent function, okay? And the unknown are the samples, let's change the color, the unknown are the samples of x, the unknown function, so the unknown are samples of x function, okay? And the matrix are alpha, let's change again the color, the matrix are alpha times the weights, sorry, alpha plus, plus the weights times the Green's function. So the, the, the elements of the linear system matrix are alpha plus the weights times the Green's function for the diagonal. And outside the diagonal, we don't have this term. Outside, when we evaluate at points that are not ti, we don't have this term. So, uh, outside the diagonal, what we have, sorry, when we, clearly outside the diagonal, we are integrating uh, points tj different than ti. So, for i different than, than j, the elements of the linear system matrix are this. In this and this, okay? And in the diagonal of the matrix, you have to add alpha here. Okay, so this formula just gives you the elements of the Nystrom linear system matrix. And remember that you compute the values of the T, abscissas, and the weights, WJ, <coughs> using a MATLAB function that I give you. Okay, then you solve the linear system and you get the solution vector X, which are just samples of the function x. And this is very nice because we don't need to use basis functions and testing functions. We don't, know, we don't need to do additional integral like the weighting integral, the inner products of the method of moments. We don't need additional integrals. The only integral that we have to approximate, and we approximate it very nicely using Gauss quadrature, is the integral of the convolution. This is the only integral that we have to compute and we compute it numerically with Gauss quadrature, and we don't have to define basis functions, no testing or weighting functions, and no additional integrals. That's very, very simple and very nice and very accurate. So, we can also, if we have, in the case, let's remove all this stuff, and now, in the case when we have the the unknown outside the integral, we can move this to the left hand side and y to the other side. And then we have, after division by alpha, we have isolated the function x for any value of t, any value of t different than the samples ti. Okay? Different than the samples. So we can obtain the, the unknown function t for any value of t, different than the samples, just computing this. And this is again a Gauss quadrature. But now here we have the evaluation point t. So these are not these are not the elements of the linear system matrix because the elements of the linear system sorry, the elements of the linear system matrix have t i, and now we have any value of t where we want to compute the unknown. And this is very accurate. In case that it is a first kind integral equation and in case that that x is not outside the unknown x is not outside the integral, in that case we cannot compute uh, easily the values of the function of the unknown function outside the samples uh, ti. Because we we are we here we obtain the unknown vector that we obtain after the solution of the linear system are samples of the unknown at points ti. Okay, so we cannot accurately compute the unknown for points x different than ti. However, we can still do a linear approximation because if we have this is x x t x t this is t if we have samples at t at t1 t2 t3 etc we can do 
uh, linear interpolation, okay? Similar to that of method of moments. And then we approximate the values of, of x that are, for example, like this. We approximate the values of x outside the samples. This in the case of a first kind integral equation that doesn't have the unknown outside the integral. If it does have the unknown uh, outside the integral, we can isolate the unknown like that, and then we can accurately compute the values of t at points different from the sampling points, outside the, the sampling points, okay? And in this case, in the case of a second kind equation, it's very, very accurate. This is the equation of the assignment. The equation of the assignment is that the operator applied to function f is function f convoluted with a cosinus, the convolution of the unknown f with a cosinus, okay? And this is equal to f, so it is a sec f is also outside the integral, it's second kind integral equation, times a constant minus some function of t. Okay. The I tell you the solution. The solution is f equal to a sinus of t. The solution is very simple. You have to solve that in the assignment. And you have to get this. The solution of method of moments with point matching, you will obtain that, versus, and this is the relative error, the relative error in the known versus the number of points. And what you expect, this is the number of points, and what you expect, this is n, okay, and what you expect is that when you increase the number of points and you improve the approximation, the error decreases, and for that reason you get a, monoton a monotonally, mono monotonally descending uh, error, okay, with n. This is the, sim the most simple point matching. It can be with the staircase, with the staircase approximation, but if you do a linear approximation in point matching, then what you get is uh, what you get is is this. So you just solve method of moments using the standard uh, rectangular pulse basis function. But once you have the samples of the unknown, so you have the samples. So this is the unknown, and you get samples of the unknown. So, instead of doing the staircase approximation that is given by the rectangular pool sampling and gives this result, which is, this is a result quite, a quite large, a quite large error, you can improve the result if you, if one, you have, once you have the samples, you do a linear approximation. So, the, this is similar to using triangular uh, basis functions. Okay. But if you use Nystrom method with a rectangular integration rule, here in Nystrom method, instead of a Gaussian quadrature, which is the best, instead of Gauss Legendre quadrature, which is the best you can do for this class of function, remember that the unknown was, was a sinus, the integral is a sinus times a cosinus, so this is very smooth and can be approximated by polynomials. So if you approximate this integral by a quadrature rule and you use a rectangular integration rule instead of Gauss Legendre quadrature, which is the best one, you get a result like this that is better, slightly better than method of moments that not much better. However, if you use Gauss Legendre quadrature points, that is the points that are accurate for polynomials up to degree 2 and minus 1, then you get a very, very, very fast convergence. The error decreases to zero, numerical zero, you know that uh, the minimum relative quantity that you can represent using double precision real numbers is 10 to minus 16, so this 10 to minus 15 is just numerical error, so this is in fact zero, numerically, okay? So you get zero error, with only uh, the, uh, that is 11 or 12, uh, sorry, 20. This is 10 and this is 20. With only 20 samples, you get a zero error. Only 20 samples. And for with 20 samples, with the simplest method of moments, 
you get a relative error larger than 10%. Okay, this is 10 to minus 1. So here the relative error will be larger than 10%. So Nystrom method is much simpler to program, much simpler to understand, and much more accurate. So it's very, 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 very good. It is, and it is very useful in other fields of science, uh, physics, and engineering in which the integral is not singular. However, in our case, in electromagnetics, our function is uh, singular. And the problem is that the <coughs> abscissas and weights that we are that we often use in the simplest case, the gauss legendre quadrature, the, in the integral is accurate for polynomials of degree up to n to n minus one, but however can be very inaccurate for singular functions like the Green's function. So we cannot apply this method directly to electromagnetic problem. There are ways to improve that. And there are ways to compute with more accuracy, with not but accuracy, accuracy the uh, integral of singular functions using a Gauss quadrature, but you have to in introduce local correction in the weights. This is the locally correcting Nystrom method. I g just gives you a paper name here. You don't have to know that. The only thing that you have to know is that it is still possible to solve electromagnetic integral equation problems with singular Green's function using Nystrom method. It's still possible, but it becomes very complicated. So complicated that people don't use it uh, unless very small um, in research groups that are dedicated to that. Often the, both the, the commercial simulation software and the normal researchers that just want to solve a problem use method of moments and don't use Nystrom method. Because I repeat, Nystrom method becomes very complicated when you have to integrate a, a singular function because the simple abscissas and weights do not work for singular functions, only work for polynomials or functions that are similar to polynomials. Well, so we finish with nice with method of moments and Nystrom and Nystrom method, and the next video will be about the solution of the linear system of equations that we have obtained using either method of moments or Nystrom method.